Sean Gordon Murphy draws influence from a number of artists. John Paul Leon is a comic book artist I often see mentioned by other professionals. With heavy amounts of black ink, he silhouettes to create atmosphere, foreboding noir-esque shading on his characters, and with darkness he creates bold and graphic environments. Safino's work is both classic and contemporary. Even with a lot of scratchy line work to provide texture, his locations and vehicles have a remarkable amount of detail, just like with Murphy's work. His figures are well drawn with natural gestures, he doesn't over exaggerate his characters. Sid Mead, futurist concept artist, best well known for his design work on Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, based on Philip K. Dick's novel Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Mead changed the way people viewed technology and society, looking towards the future. His work ignited the imagination of many and helped fuel the birth of cyberpunk. Otomo does hyper detailed line work. He has a meticulous eye for detail when he draws buildings, bikes and cars, but also an incredible craftsman at storytelling and gestural behaviour of his characters. Make sure to check out the Akira video on Beyond the Bleed for a deep dive into the work of Otomo. Sergio Topi's line work could be where we see the facial marks and render textures in Murphy's art. He's probably drawing a great deal of influence from this artist. Sean Murphy himself has mentioned the impact of Bill Waterson's Calvin and Hobbes. The stories and cartooning left a lasting impression that while Murphy's work is more realistic, you can notice he switches in between exaggerated cartooning from time to time, which definitely comes from the influence of Waterson. The undisputed master of chaotic line making and mixed media in comics has to be Bill Sienkiewicz. His style is like he's channeling a force through his hands, from ink splatter, paint, markers, tip X, it's very impressionistic, sometimes suggestive. And Murphy's art, particularly in the buildings in the distance and ink sprayed across the page, remind me of techniques that Sienkiewicz is well known for. First time I ever came into contact with Sean Gordon Murphy's work was through his deviant art, instantly drawn to the pages of Hellblazer. The combination of sketchy chaotic line work and feathering with beautiful atmospheric ink work show his deliberate technical ability and really captured the essence of that series for me, especially seeing the portrayal of London. He also got a chance to showcase his stunning ability to draw cars and motorbikes. This has to be the defining feature of his work as nobody draws vehicles quite like Murphy. He takes great care in making sure his art shows functionality of the components and how they move in a space. It might come easier for him than most, but it has to be time consuming. It's a level of detail that isn't really being matched by anyone currently working in the comic book mainstream. Generally, artists detest having to draw cars. Mike Mignola famously will avoid them at all costs. Sean Murphy moved to LA with a close friend to pursue his art career, hoping to get a job as a concept artist while pursuing his comic work. Halfway through the journey, Murphy discovered Dark Horse had sent him an email to offer him a job drawing Crush on their Rocket Comics line. Optimistically, he knew that he would be paid a few hundred dollars per page and was given at least four issues of work, and that if he didn't spend any money, he could manage it and look for more work to keep a regular source of income. During this time, he faced much hardship with very little money. He slept in his car, under picnic tables, and even sleeping in a dumpster. They declined sleeping in motels and hotels in an order to save money. This was only a temporary situation as Murphy was looking towards his short job at Dark Horse Comics. Both him and his friends started looking for an apartment. They moved out to West Hollywood. Murphy thought that as long as he could get one job like this a year, he would be able to survive, even if that meant surviving very modestly. In his words, poverty level income. I'd still have to go to shows and slog it and try to always live hand to mouth. I had no idea how I was ever gonna to afford to buy a house or have, afford to have kids or afford to get married or anything like that, afford vacations or health insurance or even having pets. I just knew that in my early to mid 20s, this was a step up and technically I'm a professional comic book artist, so I'm happy. When Murphy began getting work published, his style was far from the one he would be most recognizable for, resembling the influential style of Bruce Timm that was popularized in Batman the Animated Series. It has been homaged by many artists, but Murphy doesn't look back fondly at his work at this period. You can see his earlier style on such titles as Crush, 
Star Wars Tales for Dark Horse Comics, and Scarecrow Yearworm for DC Comics. He feels that that style was designed for animation and looks best in animation, but a comic, in his opinion, should have a higher level of detail. He scripted and drew Off-Road, published by Oni Press. Murphy got paid around $3,000 for a year and a half's worth of work. The same year, Murphy is offered the chance to work on Batman Scarecrow Year One with Bruce Jones. I, uh, I want to love Scarecrow, but the costume is such a, it's like a, a bag of leaves turned upside down for his head. Mm -hmm. He's dangly, he's not very intimidating, but he's supposed to be scary. Um, so 10 years ago, 2005, I did a uh, comic with a writer named Bruce Jones who, called Batman Scarecrow Year One. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to learn a lot about the Scarecrow in order to do it. So I remember watching this episode and basing my concept of the little kid Scarecrow off of the, uh, the cartoon here. And mm -hmm. I really tried to like it, but my takeaway from doing all that work, and it was not a good book. Sorry, Bruce, who's not listening to this. <laughs> it, it sucked. Well, not anymore. Anyway. Not anymore, no. Um, but, you know, honestly, my art was probably pretty sucky back then, too, so fair play. But uh, I just don't fucking get Scarecrow. Even having done two issues focused on him specifically, he just doesn't seem that scary. Until you get to the Nolan Scarecrow, or even in the cartoon, season four, when Scarecrow had a noose around his neck and he, was, he played it very close to the vest, that worked for me, finally. It came and went, and offers weren't flooding in. Eventually DC would offer Murphy the opportunity to work on two issues of Teen Titans and he tried to stick to DC's house style for the project but was unsatisfied with the outcome and even though DC paid him for his work the issues never came out. Then Murphy moved on to collaborate on Outer Orbit with Zach Howard. It's only when Murphy starts working on a short story, Pencils and Paper Clips, in the Angel One-Shot Masks from IDW with James Patrick and Rico Renzi that we finally get to see him lean into the style fans are familiar with. He still keeps within the boundaries of cartooning with clean and clear, thick black outlines that had still carried over from his earlier work simultaneously introduced with his feathering technique for extra texture. This material seems to be like his admiration for Alex Toth shining through. Hellblazer work follows and by this time he's in the full swing of his art style he's known for. First on Newcastle's Calling, a title that plays on the Clash's iconic punk anthem, London's Calling. His work seemed perfectly fitted for Hellblazer his skill set captures the ambience and grim gothic horror that plagues Hellblazer and follows Constantine around like a bad smell. Grant Morrison and Karen Berger picked Murphy for Joe the Barbarian and in his own words, put him on the map and would give Murphy at least one year of work. He had fun with the book, but it was one of the most challenging experiences in his comic career. He doesn't really have a passion for fantasy or magic, so it wouldn't be the ideal title to demonstrate his abilities. Morrison, on the other hand, feels very comfortable diving into chaos magic, mysticism, spirituality and the occult, well versed on the work of Alistair Crowley, Terence McKenna and Robert Anton Wilson. So these things happen, magic works, and when I started doing the comic I found that you could actually make magic happen by writing things and changing the operating system of the universe. It works and I'm here to tell you to try it when you go home tonight because it fucking works. And what happens if we all do it? Everyone in this room decides to take control of reality. I'm talking about reality. I'm talking about quantum physics. I'm talking about taking control of things from the quantum level up, from the molecular level up, and it works. This magic works. If you were impressed by Sean's work on Hellblazer, Newcastle's Calling, his work on City of Demons would surpass fans' expectations. It still sticks to nuances of atmosphere he established in Newcastle's Calling, but is more refined with finer details. The look of London is astonishing. Murphy first got to work with popular comic writer Scott Snyder on his much loved series, American Vampire. American Vampire discusses the evolution of a bloodline that's created a new kind of vampire, 
and American species. Following different decades of American history, Sean Murphy did the art for the survival of the fittest. Punk Rock Jesus, a solo creation by Sean Murphy, and outside of his Batman work, is what he is most well known for. And having a significant fan base in France, his book seems perfectly suited to that country's comic book audience. In 2019, the J2 project is started by an entertainment company known as Ophis, which is Greek for serpent. The project's purpose is to clone Jesus Christ from using samples from the Shroud of Turin. The clone is raised on an island as he is being constantly watched by a television audience, the Truman Show for zealots. Religious fanatics either rally against him with pure hatred or with love and devotion. He rebels against his expectations and pressures by becoming a punk. To quote Jean Paul Sartre, man is nothing else but that which he makes of himself. Murphy himself is an atheist and did this piece as social commentary that asks questions about faith, capitalism, science, and explores existential philosophy. In the words of novelist and art historian, Anita Bruckner, existentialism is about being a saint without God, being your own hero, without all the sanction and support of religion or society. Punk Rock Jesus may at times be uncomfortable to some, or even offensive, especially to their sensibilities in the current climate. I personally think it belongs with some of his best work. The duo of Snyder and Murphy would reunite to collaborate on creating The Wake, a 10 issue series published through Vertigo. Homeland Security recruit a marine biologist to work at a secret underwater oil rig where horrific revelations reveal themselves. They both also work together on a short story installment for Detective Comics 27. Batman reaching the end of his long career as the Dark Knight realises he will not be able to continue at the standard required to be Gotham's crime fighter. So he manages to start a cloning process for another version of himself to take up the fight. The process is continued by each clone after 25 years of activity. And then Murphy came up with a plan for his next project, Cafe Racer. Um, back in 2000... 13 maybe 14 I was doing the wake with Scott Snyder and we had this um, summer home that we bought in Maine we were living in Brooklyn at the time and I had this idea to uh, take in some apprentices or interns or whatever and uh, it was a Kickstarter uh, the idea was I'll take five students come up to Maine live with me in my house we had a big enough house with bedrooms and stuff I would vet everyone look at portfolios and choose five people each person would pay two grand. Uh, they would stay with us for two weeks without anything extra. We would provide food and um, I think they paid for drinks and some stuff too, whatever it was. And it was basically like a very unique situation that worked really well because we managed to get lucky and pick the right people. Um, God forbid one of them ended up being an asshole or a violent drinker or something, you know, that would have been bad. But luckily uh, I groomed everyone well enough where we all clicked really well, like a, like a family for two weeks two freezing cold weeks in Maine. One guy came all the way from Portugal. He had never seen snow like this and didn't even know how to put on a winter coat, which was funny. Um, and then uh, we would work in these two weeks to put together an anthology called Cafe Racer, which is not available anymore. You can probably find it on eBay. And we would, they would all get copies of this book to take to conventions to sell. So I would give, they would get the experience of working with a professional, uh, seeing behind the curtain, working on a five days a week type normal schedule for an artist. They would get the exposure of the book and then they would actually get copies of the book that they kind of paid for and then sell these things at shows and make all their money back. So it was like win, win, win. And the campaign for Kickstarter made us like 55,000. So it was enough to furnish the house we bought to buy the stuff we'd need like tables, desks, chairs, TV, whatever it was. So it was a really fun idea and I'm glad I did it. Christopher Nolan wrote a seven-page comic script drawn by Murphy. The events of the comic taking place in the story of his interstellar movie that weren't explored in the film. This comic was called Absolute Zero and was exclusively available through Wired's magazine main website. Teaming up with Mark Miller for 2015's Chrononauts, a time-traveling adventure comic that unlike Joe the Barbarian is right in Murphy's wheelhouse. 
The same year, Sean Murphy draws Tokyo Ghost, scripted by Rick Remender. The story takes place in 2089 in the Isle of LA, where everyone is addicted to technology and entertainment, like junkies looking for another digital fix to keep them occupied. Anytime I hear a concept like this, I will always be reminded of Strange Days, one of the great films from the cyberpunk genre. The two main characters leave in the familiar ground of LA, venture into the garden nation of Tokyo. Beautifully drawn, as can be expected, Murphy's passion for cyberpunk is on display from Blade Runner to Akira. When people bring up the similarities or possible connections to manga in Murphy's work, I'm positive it isn't immediate contemporary work they are referring to. It's the work on Akira by Katashiro Otomo and the art of Masamune Shiro. Sean Murphy said in an interview with ImageComics.com There's a lot of Blade Runner in there, which is a mix of a thousand different influences from 70s and 80s concept artists and futurists. Sci-fi slums are almost a trope at this point, so I just tossed in a bunch of stuff that readers would be familiar with in order for them to get into the story faster. Sean Gordon Murphy's popularity has risen exponentially with his Batman White Knight universe most commonly referred to as the Murphyverse. Clay McCormick, comic book artist and creator of Dead Meat, Bloody Hell, and co-host of the Batass podcast with Sean Murphy, focusing on analyzing Batman the Animated Series. He was an important part of the development of White Knight. Clay's involvement was a crucial bridge of support for Murphy as they both discussed the script, and Clay was instrumental in helping shape the final outcome. Without any doubt, White Knight is the most acclaimed Sean Murphy has received to date. Issue 1 sold over 86,000 copies. Distributor Diamond ranked White Knight at number 1 on their bestseller list. Bookscan that tracks sales of comics across major retailers from comic book stores, Amazon and Barnes & Noble ranked White Knight as its number 1 on their graphic novel bestseller list. It's quite obvious that DC Comics weren't entirely aware of what they had until the sales started coming back and exceeded expectations. Batman White Knight is considered an Elseworld book. Elseworlds was an imprint by DC Comics. Stories that took place outside of the DC Universe canon where writers and artists had more freedom to develop stories that might have never been able to appear in the regular continuity. Even though Batman White Knight is on DC's Black Label, I still hear it being referred to as an Elseworld book by Murphy himself. DC's Black Label reprints original material that has appeared on other imprints at DC. The intentions of Black Label are to present the traditional characters to a mature audience in a standalone title with prestige editions. The Joker manages to recover his sanity and sway public opinion in his favour, while Batman drifts further into infamy. The Joker, now referring to his name Jack Napier, uses medication to suppress his psychotic clown persona. He undergoes cosmetic surgery and focuses on mending the damage he has done to Gotham by becoming a politician. As Jack Napier, he drops his destructive obsession with Batman. It's implied in the story that this is a borderline romantic entanglement. Napier is still concerned with being able to beat Batman and disprove his ideology. He files a lawsuit against Gotham City Police Department for police brutality. He also accuses Gotham's 1% of ultra-wealthy elitists of profiting from Batman and the high crime level in Gotham, as super criminals are a means of inciting fear and anxiety to generate money from taxpayers. While doing nothing to improve the situation, he claims Arkham has a revolving door with no money being redistributed to help the patients that are taken to Arkham Asylum. By using the mind control technology of Jervis Tetch, the Mad Hatter, Napier and Harley Quinn manage to manipulate Clayface into breaking down parts of his body into particles that are slipped into drinks in order to drug the super criminals of Gotham into also being mind control pawns. Napier manages to eventually convince Nightwing, Batgirl and the police in starting a division of the department called the Gotham Terrorist Oppression Unit known as the GTO in working with the police for a better Gotham an alternative to Batman. Murphy is juggling many characters with their own motivations and plots while also commenting on society and historical tapestry of Batman's mythology. The first standout moment of this for me is when Jack Napier returns home to Harley Quinn and is greeted by an over-sexualized cheerleader parody of the true spirit of Harley Quinn, who is in fact a doppelganger for the real thing and both the real Harley and this imposter 
face off. The doppelganger wanting the Joker spontaneous, violent and chaotic and the real Harley wanting Jack Napier just the way he is, rational, focused and loving. It's funny to me that uh, now that Harley Quinn is in the mainstream with Arkham Asylum and with Suicide Squad, most of the stuff you find when you Google her is the new Harley, which she looks like a, a sexed up cheerleader. Right. Um, and girls are into her and um, they, they sort of emulate her, which I don't always understand. I'm sure stores like Hot Topic are thrilled that they have the rights to that t-shirt that that Margot wears in the movie. Yep. But um, the classic Harley, to me, is really way more interesting, more um, slightly more empowered, I guess, and uh, not so sexed up. And it seems like the new one's kind of a step back. Sean Murphy is commenting on the current state of the mishandling of the character, and it also gives him a chance to introduce a new villain into the Murphyverse as Harley's doppelganger takes on a persona of Neo Joker, a stand-in until she can get the real thing to return back to his manic, sadistic self. Now, Sean, are you, you feature, uh, not to give, I don't think this is giving too much away about the book you're working on, but it features the Mad Hatter fairly pre uh, uh, predominantly. Yeah. Or, um, is he, has he always been a, has he been a favorite of yours, or is it just something that you, a character you came to as you were writing? Well, you know, I kind of fell back into it, uh, fell ass backwards into it, and it worked out really well. So um, I kind of create a new supervillain, and um, she uh, ends up utilizing um, some of Hatter, Hatter tech. That's what I just call it. I don't know if that's in the comic, too. Um, and uh, because she needed his tech, she sort of left him... Um, she sort of embraced uh, him as a, as a sidekick, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas all the other villains are busy doing other things. And it wasn't something I planned, but it, it was nice to have a sounding board. You know, a, a single supervillain is kind of boring because what are they going to do? Just talk to themselves. But I liked uh, the Hatter as, a, as a, a, a side character. I think he actually works really well as a side character, especially mm -hmm. because the, my new villain is, is a lady. And I think um, there's a part of him that, you know, this is an older Hatter who never got Alice and there's an aspect of he's got, he's got a soft spot for, for, for ladies and it's not a romantic thing it's more like he's like a father figure in a way teaching her about how to be a super criminal um, and I ended up just I don't know getting lucky and um, my editor really loves it and it's just a bizarre pairing that I didn't plan but it just ended up working out um, I have him more as a um, hacker more of a, mm -hmm. a computer hacker than a mind control guy I mean it's probably been done before but you know obviously my control is kind of like brain hacking so there's a part of Gotham City called Backport which is in bad economic condition and is populated with minority characters first introduction in this part of the city and a stereotype of angry black youth and gang culture might get your eyes rolling and if it was approached with a more harmful racial stereotype and sloppy writing after this encounter it would no doubt become problematic but Murphy takes great care in establishing this area of the city and its people as a real functioning place that is divided from the Gotham we know. I think this is the most diverse version of Gotham City that has ever been created. Renee Montoya was also brought up in Backport and gives another window into the struggles that people face on the other side of the class system in Gotham. These environmental struggles reflect the attitudes and development of people who inhabit it. This is when we are introduced to Murphy's take on Duke Thomas, and even though White Knight is separate from the regular continuity of Batman in the DC Universe, I consider this the definitive vision of the character. Duke pretty much runs backport and respected by the people who live there. He reminded me of Luke Cage's status in his community during the Brian Michael Bendis run on Daredevil. Social issues from capitalism to racial tensions are explored by Murphy, who doesn't shy away from these concerns, handled in a very similar way to his approach of punk rock Jesus. His design of Batman is a combination of vampiric phantom with high collared cape and thigh high boots, fused with a tactical look that is much more popular in interpretation these days. I showed you my character designs for my Batsuit costume. I thought I put a lot of work into how high his boots are and the way his belt works. And uh, I got through the whole first issue and I never really got to show the costume. Uh, I never had that panel where it reveals like Sean Murphy's Batman. Yep. And I think when you said that, it doesn't matter from the waist 
down what he looks like, that's exactly right. And I went through all of these shots with you and I'm like, oh my God, like I never really lit his legs once. Yeah. You know, like Batman did not enter a light room. If he did, it was cast shadows and yeah, like it doesn't really matter because yeah. the Bastion's co- Batman's costume is shadows. It's not necessarily tights. Right. And that's why, that's why if you look at his costume and how the different ways it's drawn and represented, mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter what it's made out of because the intent is always the same, which is to create that one shape. Right. So it can be all mechanical and made out of armor and it still works, or it could right. be a sweatshirt and yeah. you know a homemade cowl and cape and it still works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, um, I have four, I think there's only basically four different kinds of Batman people mm-hmm. sort of funnel into. Uh, one is classic, which which is, you know, tights. Usually it's it's the kind of stuff you see uh, on underwear and it's licensed for kids' pajamas. Yep. Jim Lee art, you know, Silver Age type stuff too. Then you have um, tactical Batman, which is sort of Chris Nolan, which is um, uh, Arkham Asylum, where you can see his armor, you can see the buttons and the pop rivets and the gear. The third one would be um, an animated version, mm-hmm. which is obviously this one. And the fourth one for me is the Phantom Batman, mm-hmm. which to me the Phantom one is, it's very impressionistic. It's probably uh, encapsulated very well by artists like Sam Keith. It's like heavy shadows. It really works Batman into the environment. And you, it doesn't really matter where his belt is or how many, or what his chest uh, emblem looks like. It's really just a fog. Yeah. It's designed that way. And he almost looks different in each panel. The, mm-hmm. cha- the sizes of the ears will change depending on what's needed and yep. it just doesn't matter and i was going to ask you like which out of the four do you think your batman would be i think i would probably be closer to that last one where he's more of a phantom yeah but the thing that i like again the thing that makes him work is that he works in all of those things right you know and i always i always thought it was really interesting how you could have the more 70s um uh neil adams type where it's just you know skin tight whatever Mm -hmm. but if you were to push in and do a close-up and have him like pull something off of his arm to reveal armor you totally buy it yeah there's something about the costume that it it works and everything but i i prefer Mm -hmm. the more the shadowy phantom like like going back to uh not to talk too much about the movies but going back to uh you know the tim burton batman versus the chris nolan batman um i think Burton's Batman cared more about style mm-hmm. than uh, practicality, right. and I think Nolan's Batman cares more about practicality than style. Yeah, yeah. and I think the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I, mean, I, I do too. You know, and I don't think there are four distinct so much as there's usually a mix of some of those elements. Like even for mine, I try to go Phantom as much as I can. Yeah. But inevitably, he'll get back to the Batcave. He'll take off the cape. He'll put his keys on the counter and you know you have to see how he works eventually right um and like you could still try to hide it but eventually you're going to need to show him reaching into his belt for smoke bombs or grappling grabbing his bat hooker Mm -hmm. you know so yeah for me it's a mix of probably tactical batman uh, but mostly with the phantom batman if i can help it yeah yeah the batmobile looks like a combination between the rear of the 89 design and the extended vision of a spinner from Blade Runner at its front. White Knight is set in the same world as Batman the Animated Series, rather than setting itself in a version of Gotham directly from the comics. Murphy has said so multiple times on the Batass podcast. There are tons of Easter eggs that point towards the animated series, but also the live action movies. If your scope of Batman is limited just to the animated series and the movies, This is a great way of bringing new readers without having an extensive collection of reading material in order to enjoy the story. The movies and the animated series are all a part of the history in this version of the character. An obvious reference is having all the Batmobiles from his history play a key part of the story, even having the 66 Batmobile make an appearance, also referencing things that have happened in his past. Rene Montoya and Harvey Bullock have big parts within the White Knight and their chemistry with Jim Gordon is mirroring of the one established in Batman the Animated Series. Murphy didn't realise that the Joker doesn't have a definitive name. He also thought his name was Jack Napier because of the Tim Burton 1989 film. 
That's why he used it in his script, only being told after he had started that nobody has referred to him as Jack Napier outside of Burton's adaptation. Both Clay McCormick and Sean Murphy have a great admiration for Tim Burton's 89 Batman film, which influenced elements of the animated series. Both the look of Batman and the way Burton chose to shoot the character, Keaton's performance, the bold gothic design of the Batmobile, and the industrial worn art deco set pieces and matte paintings for Gotham masterfully designed by Anton Furst. Murphy has had good experiences working with writers but also experiences that have been very tough to the point where there was very little interest in working with other writers. Sean Murphy is a big fan of Paul Dini's writing for the incredible material he did on the animated series. This is possibly the only writer he would change his strong opinion on Honestly, I think it is my frustration with bad scripts that made me think, you know, I don't think I can, I'm not Hemingway, but if this guy can pump out this shit, well, I can certainly do better than that. So, you know. Well, yeah, it's it's a control thing, too. I mean, you know, you've got, um, <clears throat> as as an artist, I think, this is a general you I'm saying now. Right. As an artist, you have storytelling ability that is going to be best served, honestly, if mm -hmm. it's coming from you. Right, you know, because if you're writing a uh, assuming assuming that you know how to write right. a fairly decent story, yeah, theoretically that should visually be better than the stuff right. that you would do interpreting somebody else's because you know the right. the writer and the artist are very much on the same page. Yeah, um, yeah, that connection because there's usually a, a downgrade when you pass a script off to an artist. There's always going to be disconnect where you can do the best you can, but you're inevitably going to miss certain things so what is an a script can only be you know a b script unless you can fix it in your own way like i just feel like there's a natural downgrade of some kind whereas if you are the artist there's zero disconnect there's zero downgrade now it's just about how good you are on your own you know right i was uh i i recently got back into writing um and i was writing a writing a script for uh that with the intention to have somebody else draw it Mm -hmm. And I found it was a different process uh, because when you're writing for yourself, there's a certain amount of shorthand that you can mm -hmm. use because right. um, you've got shots and stuff in your head. So if you can be more sparse if you, uh, than you usually think you would be. Right. Um, but writing for somebody else, it was interesting because like I, you know, being an artist, I didn't want to push mm -hmm. pa panel layouts or visuals on the artist too much. But right. at the same time, I didn't want to give them too little. So it's it's interesting finding a balance writing for somebody else who's going to be interpreting this um, to get across what you want, and, and but still give them the artistic freedom to do with it what they want. Right, yeah. The thing that I, never scared me about writing for other people, and my biggest experience is writing for you guys when we did mm -hmm. the apprenticeship, so I wrote Cafe Racer, is... Like, I knew you guys were all capable artists and, and good storytellers. And I also know that you can be as precious as you want about certain things in a script. And writers get really uptight about making sure all their genius ideas make it in there. But at the end of the day, you can get rid of half of them or misinterpret half of them. And most readers aren't even going to know. Like, it, it doesn't fucking matter. Like, the things that upset most writer day to day are things that generally don't matter. As long as the outline is there, I mean, the, the dialogue will come. If the art's good and there's, you know, splashy things happening here and there, people are going to come away happy because comics readers are rooting for you because they don't want to believe that they're reading an antiquated art form that's quickly dating itself. Like, they're in your <laughs> corner, you know. You give them a B-level book, they think it's an A-level book, you know. So that's the kind of thing that makes me sort of not sweat that stuff, to be honest, is because I've taken bad scripts and made them much better. And I just assume that the writers or artists I work with will be able to do that with mine as well. You know? um, and in general, a voiceover is a giant no-no because it's lazy. You know, if every script is essentially a mystery, then um, being inside the character's head takes away a lot of the fun. Right. Um, and there are instances where it works. And of course, any, you know screenwriting professor would tell you that and they'll point to you know Shawshank Redemption or Forrest Gump or did uh, Chinatown have it I forget uh I don't think so no I guess the sleuthiness of it made me think it did but yeah you're yeah right. 
But there are times to do it. And if you do it, do it with authority and do it with good reason. But in comics, it's just used. It's just, oh, well, this is just the thing we do. It's as common as feathering. And I, right. I think it's fucking lazy. I don't think it's necessary. I think it hurts the books in general. Uh, and I think it's also has to do with the writers not feeling like they're getting to, to be writery enough. You know, like yeah. a lot of their genius wordage is wrapped up in panel descriptions, which the the reader never gets to experience. But if you have like these long paragraphs where the writer gets to do, you know, fucking cartwheels and somersaults in front of you, I think it's mostly ego driven is they want to see their their words make it on the page. And it's just not fulfilling enough. Uh, whereas if they were novelists and stuff, they would get to do that stuff, you know, to the cows come home. But in comics, I just think it's self-indulgent and it's mostly unnecessary. And I... I've never used them. I'll, I'll do it if I have a flashback and a character's talking, or if a character's like reading a letter, or if like news people, news anchors are talking about something while you're like, I'll, I'll do it here and there. But in general, like I fucking hate it, and I do out of my way to not need it. And I, I think with how detailed I draw, like I end up slowing the readers down with art rather than slowing them down with words. Well, I mean, it's funny. Oh, I, after I work with Scott, I'm, I'm going to retire from working with writers. But if there is someone that I would come out of uh, retirement, writing retirement for, it might be Paul Dini. But I would only want to do like a one-shot type of thing because I think he's really amazing at like a self-contained 44-page book like Mad Love, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you could do like a uh, Batman Black and White yeah. or something like that. If, I mean, if you want to do, do well, something thing would short. Be, like, I would hope he would take it seriously and give me something as good as Heart of Ice. But if he just if he turn if he just turned into some <laughs> drivel, and I haven't read all his stuff, so maybe he never has. But I would be disappointed if he just sort of phoned it in, and I'd call him up and be like, "I came out of retirement for you, for you." <laughs> a sequel to the White Knight, titled Curse of the White Knight, reveals the Joker has held on to a shocking secret for many years. One that will break the legacy of the Wayne family. Joker has encouraged Azrael to take the flame and sword of his ancestors, who play a crucial role in Gotham's development, and destroy the foundations that are built on lies and deceit. A tragic series of events leads to the escalation of conflict with Batman and his closest allies, as Bruce has an existential crisis. There were some great moments in the comic, emotionally well paced parts of the story, like losing someone close to you or seeing a group of friends enjoy each other's company. When Bruce is caught between staying distant yet strong and opens up to reveal his vulnerability as he starts questioning things, these small character moments are the strongest parts of the story for me. Azrael is a character I've never been a huge fan of, but I love the design of the armoured Azrael and the way he's presented and drawn by Sean Murphy. The action portions of the story are drawn with a stunning level of quality but it didn't feel as spectacular as they were presented in the first book. That's not a result of Murphy's art skills. It's everything before and after. There's a moment when all the Batmobiles are speeding across Gotham and Batman is behind the wheel of the 89 Batmobile. Murphy quotes Keaton and it was perfect timing, but the scene itself felt like it was repeating a moment from White Knight that had much stronger sense of impact. The Wayne family lineage with Edmund Wayne and Baca in their pursuit against Laffy Arkham, rumoured to be a demon or vampire that drinks the blood of small children. He is the Joker before there ever was one. From the first pages I was curious, but as it went on, I felt like I was being pulled away from the main story. The stakes just weren't as high as I was led to believe, while White Knight had much more urgency and drama that made the action that much more extraordinary. With introducing a secret cult society into the story, I was very intrigued, more than I was with Edmund Wayne, Barker and Laffy. Jason Blood, the host to the demon Etrigan, makes a cameo and it was a great way of building the scope of Gotham and its secrets. Unfortunately, since White Knight is set after the events of Batman the Animated Series, being a basis for the comic, Jason Blood already makes an appearance in the show with Batman being allies with Blood, while the comic shows that this is the first time they've ever met. Murphy originally wanted to do a sequel with heavy influences from Castlevania, but ultimately the story went into another direction. Um, it's funny you mention how Elseworlds uh, books are usually a lot more out there because your first pitch to me mm -hmm. of this was... <laughs> Castlevania, but with Batman, and I was like, "What is? What do you mean?" And right. then you're like, 
like imagine Castlevania, <laughs> and there are <laughs> monster equivalents of every Batman villain. Yep. And then that's just what it is. And I and I was kind of like, I, you're really gonna need to sell this to me. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> right. it was such a departure from the first one. Yeah. Um, that I was not sure that it was uh, uh, necessarily the way to go. Right. Um, but as you started fleshing it out, and, and it, it's it's funny because I I don't know I don't know if I want to say un- unfortunately or fortunately, a lot of that stuff ended up being stripped way 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 back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know how you f- how you feel about that in in the end product because I know that you really wanted to do a lot of the swashbuckling stuff. Yeah. And there's definitely not as much in it as there was on first pitch. Right. So yeah, you you reminded me. Um, when I was writing volume one, I think I was halfway through and I came up with this idea of, I don't know, I was going through a Castlevania phase mm-hmm. again. And I'm talking NES, Super yes. Nintendo Castlevania before it got all uh, anime. And I thought, you know, what if Batman was Simon Belmont? What if uh, Joker was Dracula? You're Jokula. What if <laughs> Frankenstein was like Bane? Mm-hmm. What if Croc was Creature from the Black Lagoon? What if Catwoman was a witch, like a woman who flew around in a uh, broom and turned mm-hmm. into a cat? So there's all these like count the Universal monsters. I'm talking the Mummy, all the classic Universal Studios shit. You can easily see how uh, the villains gallery um, mirrors a lot of that. And I right, thought, this right. is a great. Idea. This is a cool idea. I do remember though that you know, you know that Orange County Choppers meme where the two guys are yelling at each other. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I feel like we ended up at that point because I was very dead set on the fact that Ra's al Ghul should be Dracula, not Joker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we got into one of those like minutia, stupid comic <laughs> and book then things. Then I threw the door. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I, my, I, you're not wrong. But for the in my mind, the way I wanted to lay the story out was if this was a video game mm-hmm. and you had to fight all these mini bosses to get to the big boss, the mm-hmm. biggest boss in Gotham would be Joker, right? And he would be this Dracula guy, right. and. uh you know, I knew a little bit about the difference between American vampires versus European vampires. European vampires, um, uh, oh man, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember what made the difference. But I know American vampires, it was a specific thing with um, consumption, also yes, known as tuberculosis. Yeah, yeah. And when they found these, uh, when you dig up a body buried in the colonial times in the U.S., you know, consumption and dehydration made the teeth look longer and mm-hmm. the nails look longer. And they thought, Perhaps these people were buried alive. There's they, a famous one in, I think, Rhode Island or, or, yeah. or New England. There's a, a, a yeah. famous story about a, a young girl who they thought was a vampire. Right. Yeah. They, they buried people with bells. So if you mm-hmm. were accidentally buried alive, you could ring the bell and insanity like that. And that was, like, I, I believe, a very American spin on the vampire thing, which is different than European vampires. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott, Scott Snyder would actually be very helpful, <laughs> <laughs> seeing as I'm using the phrase American vampire now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, what if Joker was a, dra- a vampire and he was, uh, like, had consumption and he was, you know, lording over Gotham Valley and, and allowing the criminal element to trade and make money, they would just ship him children. He would just suck the blood out of these children. And what if that's pretty dark? Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually, it's funny. The first, my opening scene originally was a child running through the woods in Gotham Valley and a vampire attacks his child and, like, yeah, that's right. Murders his child, and you said that's that's really dark. <laughs> yeah, not only not only was it really dark, but it also, you know, by the time you got to the scripting phase, um, that the story had turned into something else. Yeah, and starting it that way, I think would have put the emphasis on the wrong part of that flashback story. Right. You're right. Um, and so starting it the way you did, where it's with uh, Edmund and all that yeah. kind of stuff, I think. You know, puts you right into the stuff that you should be paying attention to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I I had this story I wanted to do called I called it Castlevania as a <laughs> joke. Uh, but when DC gave me a green light and I sent it to DC as a pitch, like, hey, here's something I want to do someday. You know, if anyone's going to do a vampire Joker story, like, let me know because mm-hmm. I'd rather do mine first type of thing. And I don't think anybody read it; they just filed it away. Sure. So when they said to do a sequel, I, I pulled that pitch out and I thought, I really want to do this, but. I know this is not the appropriate follow-up to White Knight because this is a completely different genre. Right. Uh, right. I'm not even a horror fan, and mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know why I'm messing around with Castlevania. Honestly, <laughs> I just like sword fighting. Uh, and so then I thought, well, what if there's a connection from this 1600s uh, Castlevania story to 
Bruce Wayne now? What if we went way back further than I believe anyone's gone mm. to talk about the nobility of the Wayne family and how the Wayne's first, the first Wayne that came to Gotham was mm-hmm. like a phrase that kept repeating in my head. Um, and I, uh, I wanted to create, instead of using Azrael, I wanted to have a um, Knights Templar type character or some kind of cult that's been around forever and mm-hmm. Gotham and pulling the levers in some way. Uh, and the reason I wanted to do that was financial reasons. You know, if you create a character that's your own, you own equity in that right, character. Right. So if I created a guy, you know, uh, like that, um, then if they ever made a movie on it, I'd make I'd make extra money, which sure. is which is cool. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more it made more sense just to use Azrael. Curse of the White Knight is highly ambitious. That may pay off for some, and not for others. But in my opinion, it's a good Batman tale. I'm happy to be back in the Murphyverse but I don't think it surpasses the original. Katana Collins, erotic romance novelist and the wife of Sean Murphy, writes the spin-off, Harley Quinn title, with art by Matteo Scalera, following on after the story in Curse. With lyrical dialogue, well-crafted storytelling, not overwhelming the pages, with so much text that it drowns out the effect of Scalera's art, which can be a problem with a writer outside of comics coming in. This is not a problem as Collins writes her comic like a seasoned professional who understands the full and has been working at it for years. No doubt Sean Murphy is consulting and helping with the shape of an extension of his Murphyverse, but it's Collins' writing that is witty and compelling that complements the art of Scalera. Murphy drops in clues about Mr. Freeze's past as his father was a Nazi SS officer, but he was pardoned and he personally knew the Waynes. An obvious reference to the real history of Operation Paperclip, where Nazi scientists were allowed to come to America to be employed in the US government and even did work for NASA. Explored fully in the Mr. Freeze spin-off title written by Murphy and drawn by Klaus Janssen. Murphy is currently working on his latest comic series, The Plot Holes, which he announced through an Indiegogo campaign. He has reached his target and is currently working on his new series. I'm very excited to see the next projects to come from Murphy. He is a creator who is doing original material that isn't trying to rehash generic ideas. This is what his fans admire about his work, it's quite unlike anything else. With a bombardment of Batman titles and other comics featuring the character, he managed to stand out. I'm confident that it's only a matter of time before White Knight gets an animated adaption. The sooner the better. His work has a voice with fierce originality that presents his passions and influences. Murphy isn't pandering to his audience by guessing what's successful or resorting to cheap tricks. His writing and artwork carry a personal honesty. So, first question is from Clay, fan of the show, first time, long time. You? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, it was just piggybacking off the off the curse of the White Knight discussion. Yep. Um, one of the things that kind of made me hesitant about the uh, all of the the monster stuff and and you know all of this flashback stuff is that I was worried that the stuff that people really liked about the first one mm-hmm. wasn't going to be there for the second one because you know you had introduced Neo Joker and she's nowhere to be seen. And all right. That. Do you, do you feel do you feel like you made the right decision just keeping that stuff to the side? I'm not saying you didn't. I'm just yeah. curious how you feel about it. Um, it changes. Yeah. I uh, is there a more appropriate sequel that has more connection to Volume One? Maybe. Yeah. You know, doing this Castlevania uh, flashback thing might not have been the right move, but um. I think by the halfway through the the book, it, people are going to start seeing Volume One pop up again yeah, in some ways yeah. because it's like, oh, that's why we're seeing this 1600 stuff. Mm-hmm. That's why it's still a political book. It's still sure, about yeah. consequences and all yeah. that stuff. It's not. It's not as overtly political, but the stuff right. that you're doing still is fairly yeah. political. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I, I wanted to steer clear of it so they wouldn't compete. Like, subscribe, and keep living in fiction.